Hello and welcome back to the cutting room. We're still John, Matt and Westy. Yes, we are. And this is part two of our Pulp Fiction episode. The other parts are on our YouTube channel and here we're getting right into it to talk about the writing of Pulp Fiction and the main cast. Mm -hmm. So here it is. It's the writing. Pulp Fiction was written by Quentin Tarantino with his stories by co-credit being given to Roger Avery, Tarantino's third writing credit at the time after Reservoir Dogs and True Romance and Avery's mm. second after writing and directing Killing Zoe. Yeah. Yep. How good's the screenplay here then, Matt? I think it's incredible. And one of my favourite things is just how funny it is. <laughs> <laughs> so many scenes yeah. is ploughed as, as black comedy basically and loads of laugh out moments. Marcellus is casually walking out in front of Butch at the traffic light. That's really <laughs> funny. <laughs> the whole Mia and Vince day, which is just a farce from beginning to end, really. Like, Vincent talking to himself in the mirror to try and make sure he doesn't sleep with her and he just goes home. Never fails to make me really laugh. Walk out the door, get in the car, go home, jerk off, and that's all you're going to do. Um, <laughs> yeah. But I think the real comic standout is everything that happens to Marvin because it's set up so brilliantly because they're not even threatening him considering the situation. Man, I don't even have an opinion. They're actually being quite nice, trying to get him involved in the conversation. Gotta have an opinion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but as soon as Vince turns around, just casually dangling that gun, you know it's not going to yeah. end well. <laughs> Yeah. And that it's cuts. a cut to the outside of the car, isn't it? Yeah, oh, exactly. Yeah. I mean, in terms of editing, that is as perfect com comic time as it exploding. And it just gets funnier from then on in because, I mean, I actually quite like Tarantino's acting in this one. I think he is quite funny as Jimmy. I don't need you to tell me how fucking good my coffee is, okay? A little goes a long way with Tarantino acting, and I think this is just right. Yeah. But then you've got Harvey Keitel as Mr. Wolf. <laughs> who is quite possibly my favourite Tarantino character because he's hilarious, he's amazing. Like, having a cocktail party at 8 in the morning, what's all that about? <laughs> what a party, still going on. And, like, he's built up as this fixer who can solve any problem. All he tells him to do is clean the car. I could have <laughs> yeah. done that. Like, that's really funny. So, pretty please, with sugar on top, clean the fucking car. Yeah, yeah pretty please. You know, <laughs> <sugar on top. laughs> They're griping about it is really funny, getting the horse down, that's hilarious. But what I think is the funniest line of the film, and it's all down to Kaitel's delivery, is when Jimmy says he can't believe it's the same car, and Mr. Wolf just goes, Well, let's not start sucking each other's dicks quite yet. <laughs> yeah. Really funny, really funny. It's scene. when he gets the coffee and he's like, Yeah. Mm. yeah. <laughs> oh, he loves that coffee. moment. Yeah. yeah. Brilliant, love Mr. Wolf. So, yeah, it's very funny, but. Underneath that, it does have the serious theme, which Tarantino himself said, well, the theme is redemption and salvation. Me gets saved by Vincent, but redeems himself in Marcellus's eye, so he gets a second chance. And Jules, in that final scene, he redeems not only himself, but Ringo and Yolanda. And the only character who doesn't get redeemed is Vince, and that's because he disagrees with Jules, and he's the only character who gets killed. Yeah, I mean, Pulp Fiction was massively original at the time it came out, wasn't it? And it's not in the subject matter, mobsters and boxers, seen that before it's in the identity it has Tarantino mm. stamped all over Pulp Fiction and nowhere mm. more so than in the writing I don't think and I think mm. Pulp Fiction carries some of his chief writing trademarks so there's the non-linear narrative many of Tarantino's stories are told out of sequence and Pulp Fiction's no different there's actually yeah. three narratives one where Vincent is the protagonist, one where Butch is the protagonist, and one mm. where Jules is the protagonist. The three stories have pretty much nothing to do with each other, but because Tarantino has characters overlap, so Vincent's the protagonist in his narrative, and then a supporting character in Jules and in Butch's narratives, that makes it seem a lot more complicated than it actually is. Mm -hmm. Something that I love about the narrative is that it's circular. So the opening scene in the diner is the start of the final sequence in the film. Also when Butch and Fabienne drive off on Zed's motorbike. Zed's dead. It's not the last thing we see in the film, but if the story were told linear, it would be. And yeah. the first thing we hear in the movie is the sound of that motorbike. Motorbike, yeah. And so the story starts where it ends when told linear and non-linear. I mean, not daft old Quentin, is he? Oh, brilliant. <laughs> Mad as a box of frogs, but not daft. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and another Tarantino hallmark is the dialogue or the type of dialogue where he has his characters talk about trivial subjects to hit men talking about McDonald's and Burger King and foot massages. <laughs> Don't be telling me about foot massages. I'm the foot fucking master. I think Pulp Fiction is still Tarantino's masterclass for me, and he and Roger Avery won a much-deserved Oscar for it as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think this is probably the only award I'm going to win here tonight. And Westy. 
what do you think of the writing here? Yeah, I mean, yeah, like I said before, I mean, it's mainly the dialogue for me, but it's how clever that dialogue is and how listenable it is and yeah. how non-boring it is. Mm. I mean, there's, there's pop culture references all the way through it. Nobody's going to hurt anybody. We're all going to be like three little Fonzies here. There's all of this product placement and his own product placement, but also things that already exist. Did he get some money from McDonald's? Because... What do they call a Big Mac? Big Mac's a Big Mac, but they call it Love Big Mac. Little Big Mac. He really promotes McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> and then slams Burger King. What do they call a Whopper? I don't know. I didn't go on a Burger King. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then he promotes Pepsi and then slams Coke. I mean, it could be God stopped the bullets or he changed Coke to Pepsi. He found my fucking car keys. He promotes his music through it. Cool and the Gang had never been more popular after this film. And that's <laughs> yeah. it within the dialogue. Hey, that's Cool and the Gang. You know, we don't want to fuck your shit up. And the, the fact that he really dislikes the 80s. And I find that really, really, really clever the way he does that. There's that one carrot that lying on there, calls him flock of seagulls and then shoots him before he can speak. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I break your concentration? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. so he cancels out 80s culture immediately yeah. and just yeah. sticks with the 70s and comes back to Jules which is absolutely incredible genius it's all genius I just love the way he puts that in there and makes it bl you're blind to it it's just within there and it's promotion it's fantastic yeah, and even at the time when you see interviews with the cast, there was already a real reverence for the screenplay for Pulp Fiction. Yeah. He has a great facility for writing uh, natural dialogue. The great thing I think about Quentin's writing is that it all seems real. Shakespeare said, holding the mirror up to nature. That's pretty much what, what I feel his writing. There's a respect for the writing that I haven't seen since I worked in, you know, in New York on, on stage. I and mean, how many people bought it afterwards? I've still got it. I, yeah. It was one of the first screenplays I bought. You see, yeah. you're like, I, want, I want to read that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think we should talk about Roger Avery a bit, though, because he was yeah. an old work friend of Tarantino's that worked at a thing was called Video Archives. Mm -hmm. yeah. Back in the day, that was a rental shop. And I know originally they were inspired by a horror film from 63 called Black Sabbath. Starring the incomparable Boris Karloff and lush and lovely women. Which... Fact fans is also where the band got their name from. So very nice. <laughs> um, because that film's written in three distinctive parts. So that's what gave them the initial idea. And, and they were going to call it Black Mask because that was like a, a crime magazine back then. Yeah. I'd have loved a cameo from Sabbath in there. <laughs> Absolute <laughs> mental. Where? <laughs> <laughs> Aussie is the gim. <laughs> hey, maybe he was. Who knows? Maybe. Well, you don't know. You don't know. But as well as Roger Avery, QT was also helped out by another pal of his, a woman called Linda Chen, typed up Tarantino's handwritten notes. And yeah. she said, his handwriting is atrocious. He gave me 500 pages of notes and it was the ramblings of a madman. <laughs> she gets a nod in the film too, Linda Chen. Do you know where or how? Mm. No. No, don't. Honey Bunny was named after Linda Chen's pet rabbit. Oh, right. Yeah, oh, right. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I love you, Honey Bunny. And the other thing I know about this is that when Restaurant Dogs was hit, obviously Tarantino was, you know, had a bit of money to spend. So he took a three month trip to Amsterdam to write this one. Very and that's nice. why the, you get so many references <laughs> to Europe. I know, yeah. And yeah. <laughs> then thing is like nobody quite knows whether it was like Tarantino's ego demanded it or whether the studio like came down and said it. But at some point, Roger Avery had his writing credit downgraded. So it was no longer co written by Roger Avery. It's stories by Roger Avery instead. Yeah. Yeah. Must have infuriated Roger Avery that. Must have. Yeah. <laughs> and for anyone interested, the story Avery wrote was the Gold Watch. Gold Watch, yeah. That's it. This watch. Another person who read it was Mike Medavoy, who's the head of TriStar, who was one of the first mm. people to get it. And he just did not get it. He just basically <laughs> sent notes back saying, what's going on? Someone's dead, and then they're alive. <laughs> the worst thing ever written, and too demented. <laughs> All true. He, yeah, it is, it is true, but he, he turned the script around. Didn't like the violence, didn't like the drug references. So of everybody, Danny DeVito got a hold of it. Of course he did. And then took it to, uh, took it to Weinstein at Miramax, and obviously Weinstein fucking loved it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> obviously uh, and from there it, it, it got made so fantastic but for someone to read that and go i don't get it at all it's just mm. a moron yeah surely mm. yeah we've got some actual footage here of harvey weinstein rushing to buy the rights to pulp fiction <laughs> so like i just want to mention some details though that i think really stand now because they're only like really hit you in that respect so at the beginning yolanda very famously shouts <laughs> Every motherfucking last one of you! 
<coughs> but when it gets to the end, it's different. Any of you fucking pricks move! And I'll execute every one of your motherfuckers! And Tarantino did that on purpose. It wasn't a mistake, obviously, because the opening scene is from Yolanda's POV and the end is from Jules's POV, so he remembers it differently. That's why it's different dialogue. Right. Yeah. It's the way he speaks, he would end up with motherfuckers, wouldn't he? You're a smart motherfucker. Yeah, you believe Tarantino on that? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, the bullet holes are in the wall. Yeah, they're supposed to be there. Yeah. It's a, it's foreshadowing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And in the opening scene, we see Vincent in the background walking to the toilet, which is a lovely touch. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's a great touch. Another nice little detail is when Ringo and Yolanda hold up the diner. Ringo grabs the manager, and the manager says, I am not a hero, I'm just a coffee shop. In the end credits, the actor's role is given as coffee shop. Coffee shop, yeah. <laughs> yeah, <I'm> sorry, yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Another great detail as well is them uh, red apple cigarettes. A pack of red apples. Yeah. Oh. Which, you should invent your own cigarettes. Absolutely <laughs> yeah, brilliant. Yeah. Butch has them, Mia has them. Um, they're in other films as well, in Kill Bill, of course, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood as well. So, like, yeah, as soon as Butch gets paid off Marcellus, Buy, uh, buy some red apples. How expensive yeah. are they? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Big Kahuna Burger is also in Reservoir Dogs as well. It is, yeah. The way, and yeah. Dusteldon. Yeah. yeah. yeah and Red Burger yeah. looks awesome, to be fair. It does, yeah. <laughs> it's the best close-up of a burger I've ever yeah. seen. That <laughs> cheese. I just want to dive into it. Yeah. Half seven in the morning, though. That's yeah. a brave choice. Yeah. <laughs> Sprite, good. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sprite for breakfast. <laughs> And Westy, in our younger years, surely me and you would have smoked red apples if we could have. <laughs> oh, absolutely. We went to Manchester just to get packed on a lucky strike. Don't remember that? <laughs> These were in platoon, I think. <laughs> we're in Vietnam helmets, walking around Manchester. <laughs> so a huge screenplay on Pulp Fiction. Credit not going entirely where it was due, maybe. But the final script mm. is an iconic piece of work. It's it flawless. Yeah. That's what it is. It's very much an ensemble cast setup in Pulp Fiction. Not easy to pick out individuals, but we're going to try, aren't we? Yes, we are. Yeah. Yep. So, who are you going for, Matt? Going for Jackson because nice. it's just a role where, like, it's just, it's got all the hallmarks of an actor who's desperate to break through to the big time. Like, yeah. small but memorable roles in Goodfellas, Jurassic Park. Hold on to your butt. But this is the one, and he knows it, and he just falls on that dialogue, and he just devours it like he devours that <laughs> cheeseburger. Mm-hmm. This is a tasty burger. And <laughs> I don't think it's any surprise he's featured in more Tarantino films than anyone else because they just get each other. He knows whatever character he gets, Tarantino knows he'll deliver, and Jackson knows what Tarantino wants every time. And I think he sets the standard. You're the evil man. And I'm the righteous man. It feels to me like he's almost telling to follow what to do. Like, this is how good you have to be. This is how good this film is going to be. We have to be this level. It's shit like this that's going to bring this situation to a head, man. And I think Jules, this is one of the standout roles Tarantino's created for anyone. Like, yeah. really cool, really funny, really charming. You think this guy would be brilliant to hang out with, but absolutely someone you wouldn't cross. You're the weak because he is someone that deadly and that serious, but that intelligent, I totally buy the change of heart that he has throughout the film. God came down from heaven and stopped these motherfucking bullets. Like yeah. He's one of the few characters who gets a proper arc and a proper moral journey. You know, he leaves the life behind. He gets to live to wander the earth. Vincent doesn't and Vincent dies because of it. So yeah, I think it's just one of Tarantino's best characters, one of the best performances you'll see in a Tarantino film. And yeah. got to talk about the hair, obviously, because I know Jules yeah, originally was written as having a huge afro, which would have been amazing. I would yeah. love to see that. But <laughs> the crew member that Tarantino set, sent out to buy the wig, he came back with a jerry curl instead. And actually, <laughs> it was Jackson who loved it. And that's why it's in the film, because Jackson said, no, no, that'll work. It's a great yeah. touch. His references throughout are brilliant. What do you mean, walk to earth? You know, like Kane in Kung Fu. Just like, yeah, a, right, it just rolls <laughs> off. And then he, when he talks about the charming pig. I mean, he had to be 10 times more charming than that arm on green ankles. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Have you seen that? That is so <laughs> funny. It's my boy here. Oh. Right. It's funny, that. I hope I'm not seeing it. Yeah, and when you see promo shots of Sam Jackson as Jules, he's not wearing the wig. No. And it looks yeah. really weird. It yeah. does. I mean, yeah. he is superb. And even though the part was written for Jackson, he almost lost the role. Paul Calderon auditioned for Jules and he blew Tarantino away. So Jackson had yeah. to come back and audition again. 
Oh, he wow. was livid about it, apparently, and turned up for the audition raging. And when that came across <laughs> in the audition, that got him the part. Fair yeah. enough. Tarantino did cast Paul Calderon as well, though. He plays Paul, the barman, in yeah. Marcella's strip joint. My name's Paul, and this is just between y'all. <laughs> didn't, they, didn't Jackson come in with a cheeseburger? He That's stopped right, on the yeah. way, and they kicked the door open and scared the cheeseburger oh, wow. and read the lines. <laughs> <laughs> yes, get in. Just like Jules. <laughs> just like Jules, amazing. So, yeah, Sam Jackson as Jules there, massive performance. His yeah. best? Yes. I Example. So, yeah. I'm trying real hard to be the shepherd. And Westy, which cast member are you going to talk about? I'm going to go for Bruce Willis as Butch mm-hmm. because I don't think he gets enough love in this film. You almost forget he's in it somehow yeah. because he's overshadowed by You just see on all of the promotional material, it's all Vincent and Jules, it's yeah. all Mia, it's all that kind of, you know, that action, that really sexy kind of vibe. And then what, what Willis brings <laughs> to it is this real human element, I think. He's, he brings a real guilt that he's not living up to what his dad lived up to and what his granddad lived up to. And he's lectured at a small age where, you know, this watch and you have to look after it. And he just, you know, he, he suffers from pride like and guilt that it brings him down and he doesn't know yeah. what to do with it. But the character is so believable. But he did, he wanted to play Vincent and he was hell bent on it. Even to the point where he invited right. Tarantino over to his house to discuss it. He said, I can do this. I like this part. It's going to be really good for us. And Tarantino just wasn't having it. So he just said, look, read it again. Just think of you as Butch and what you can bring to it. Mm. So the next day, you got a phone call. Sure enough, Bruce Willis just said, yep, yeah, I can do Butch. If you want us to do Butch, I'll do it. It would be fantastic. Is yeah. Travolta wearing a wig in this? He definitely Surely. is. Yeah, Imagine sure. Willis in sure. that wig. Yeah. <laughs> 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 just turning around, big earring in. Royal cheese. <laughs> yeah. He hasn't got the moves either. He hasn't got Travolta's moves. Of course he has yeah. But I mean, you believe that character when he's talking to Vincent at the bar. Looking at something, friend? Ain't my friend, Peluca. You totally mm-hmm. believe that. The depth of the emotion when he turns around the door at the pawn shop and he's just weighed down with that guilt yeah. of like, I can't yeah. leave him. Yeah. And you know that the watch was bought in a general store in Tennessee, which is what Walton tells him. And then he's got a Tennessee license plate straight over his shoulder. Oh, oh, all right, nice. All right. And when he's picking up all them weapons in the pawn shop and he's choosing one after yeah. the other and it gets yeah. funnier from a hammer to a yeah. chainsaw and then a samurai sword. <laughs> just genius things like that that I think really works. And I think Willis gets that as a character because he doesn't have much dialogue, but what he does with his expressions and his personality in the film really, really works. Yeah, I think he's really good. Famously yeah. quite difficult to work with, Bruce Willis. A good day to die. I don't think he was on this, though. Yeah, exactly. I think it's testament to Tarantino as a director that even Willis seemed to like him and respect him on the set. Yeah. Is this the finest moment of your acting career, or what? This is the pinnacle. From here on in, it slides down the backside. Ooh, of Before Willis was cast, though, another actor did say no to playing Butch. Do you know who? It was... Oh, he was younger, wasn't he? No, because it was rewritten for an older... Um, yeah. Oh, it puts out my misery. It was actually Mickey Rourke. Mickey Rourke, yeah. He passed on the role in order to pursue his real life boxing career. And he said at the time, the script is nonsense. And <laughs> then <laughs> said later, when he was acting again, to be honest, I didn't understand it. <laughs> <laughs> what a fantastic career move. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> thing is though about Butch he was originally written as an up and coming younger boxer so uh, yeah that's yeah in, instead it was off to Matt Dillon who loved mm. the script but then bizarrely asked if he could sleep on it which Tarantino I think didn't take quite well to so he said no straight away and, <laughs> and then I think I don't know whether it was despite him or what but he changed Butch to be an older boxer over the hill and then that's how Bruce Willis could play him instead but yeah Dillon just totally blew it yeah Tarantino developing a bit of an ego I think yeah, you need probably. to think about yeah. it. You can do one. Yeah. yeah. It just knows how good it is. That's what yeah, I mean about yeah. the confidence. Yeah. 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 Also, I can easily imagine Matt Dillon in the role as well. Easily. Yeah, I could. I could. Yeah, yeah. as a younger one. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. Bruce Willis, then, a good performance from him. Probably one of his best. Mm. And I mean, so. certainly better than his singing career. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Secret <laughs> Agent Man. <laughs> Agent For my cast member, I'm talking about JT. John Travolta as the dancing drug addict of the piece, <laughs> Vincent Vega. Yeah. Yep. He's really funny. Brings lots of humour to the script. Even at times, I think, when the humour might not be there on the page. That's what you're going to be, man. You're going to be a fucking bum. And Travolta's mm. career famously was a bit in the doldrums at the time, wasn't it? Mm. And was. Pulp Fiction revitalised it. To say the least. Yeah, I mean, Shamey went on to go and make some absolute crap after it. But yeah. as Vincent, he's superb. Far too laid right. back to be a hitman, but Travolta <laughs> brings a very... 
likeable charm to the role, mm -hmm. and his line delivery is just excellent. Yeah, my bacon tastes good. Pork chops taste good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he is great but like pretty much everyone in the script there was another name in the frame at one point which from Reservoir Dogs it was Michael Madsen but then yeah. Madsen couldn't do it because he'd sign up to play um, Virgil in Wide Earp and said bad choice <laughs> <laughs> and then when Tarantino met Travolli he gave him the choice of two roles it was either Vince in this or he had the script from Dust Till Dawn so he offered him Seth Gecko. But Travolta said, well, it's simple. I'm just not a vampire guy, so he chose Vince instead. I don't fucking believe in vampires. So a vampire has no chance. Battlefield Earth, though, sign me up. <laughs> <laughs> just straight in there. Oh, you're too much. Yeah, when Tarantino sent his list of demands to Harvey Weinstein, the only one Weinstein refused was casting Travolta. And Tarantino right. said he would pull out the deal if he couldn't cast Travolta, so Weinstein had no choice but to agree. Fair play. And we've got some footage here, actually, of Harvey Weinstein talking about that. <laughs> Yeah, Travolta obviously wanted to know and get a little bit more depth into the heroin side of things just to play that confidently yeah. and portray it in, in, a, in a way that was believable, I guess. And one of Tarantino's old friends was a heroin addict, recovering heroin addict, and said to Travolta, the best way that you could experience it is just to do tequila shots in warm water. <laughs> Wow. Which I'm gonna try. That sounds <laughs> that sounds quite good. But he did it. Him and his wife did it. Hotel room in the bath. She kept an eye on him, and he just had the shots lined up in the end of the bath and yeah. tried it. <laughs> Travolta was doing that already. <laughs> it must work. It, it looks really believable. <laughs> Again, QT had a huge list of names for potential Vincents: Sean Penn, William Hurt, and James Gandolfini were all considered to play Vincent. Mm. Daniel Day Lewis apparently wanted the part, but Tarantino said no. Wow. I can't imagine many people have turned Dale Lewis down. No, but, that's confidence, like. Yeah, but Travolta said Tarantino loved him. His favourite actor was me, and his favourite actor was me. and Liked him so much, he said that twice. <laughs> <laughs> Jason got a big pussy. <laughs> <laughs> and at one point, Tarantino considered changing the characters of Jules and Vincent to two English guys and casting Tim Roth and Gary Oldman. That could have been right. awesome. Yeah. That would have been amazing. <laughs> Pulp Fiction was the rebirth of John Travolta. He is excellent as Vincent. And yeah. without this, we would never have had Michael. We please oh. the angel. Yeah, which <laughs> is great. <laughs> or Broken Arrow. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right, Broken Arrow. Yeah. It is all right. Damn, what a rush. We should also talk about the only woman in the main cast. Uma mm -hmm. Thurman plays Mia Wallace, the wife of Marcellus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you wouldn't guess it though, they never talk to each other in the whole film. <laughs> yeah. no, <you> <laughs> so how's Uma Thurman in the film? I think she's great. I mean, that role, instantly iconic. I said, God damn! That haircut, the white blouse, the black jacket combo, mm -hmm. just looked so good as soon as you see you on screen. And like, I do wonder what they would have put on the poster if she didn't look as amazing as she does here. Because mm. like, how many student walls in oh, the nineties, in the two thousand, had, everywhere, had yeah. that everywhere. poster? Yeah. Everyone had it. And Thurman's like a strange actress to talk about because she's only ever good with Tarantino. She's amazing in both the Kill Bills and amazing in this as well. But outside of it, not not so much. Yeah. Bizarrely enough, Uma Thurman actually said no when she was approached to play it because she was a bit concerned oh. about all the rape sequences, mm. maybe the violence as well in the language, I don't know. But she said no, I, I, she wasn't really interested. So Tarantino rang her up and read the script. I don't know if he read all of it, but he read the script <laughs> over the phone to her. I wouldn't be surprised. I, th I think he, she would just wanted him to shut the fuck up. She's just like, yeah, I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll do it. All right. He's like, okay, 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 okay. okay shut up. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, she's really charismatic, I think, as Mia. Yeah. There were lots of other names on Tarantino shortlist again, but the ones who came closest, Isabella Rossellini, Meg Ryan, Halle Berry, and Michelle Pfeiffer were all interviewed or auditioned. Mm -hmm. wow. And apparently, two big sitcom stars just missed out. That was Jennifer Aniston, famous for Friends, of course, and Julia Louis-Dreyfus, who played yeah. Elaine in Seinfeld. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Like any of those, as Mia? <laughs> Meg Ryan could have been good. I Meg reckon. Ryan would have been... I, I like Michelle yeah. Pfeiffer would have been good. Yeah. yeah, Pfeiffer would have been excellent. But glad we know Thurman, though. Yeah, I mean, she is excellent as Mia Wallace. Again, the launch pad for her career and still yeah. one of her best performances. Oh, absolutely. Definitely. Definitely. Probably the less little screen time as well, but she's fantastic mm -hmm. in every scene. Ketchup. 
Pulp Fiction is a big ensemble piece, like I mentioned, and there are lots of other excellent actors and performances in the film. Christopher Walken as Captain Coons, Ving Reigns as Marcellus Wallace, Eric Stoltz as Lance, Tim Roth as Ringo, and Amanda Plummer as Yolanda are all memorable. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The main four, though, four big names and all at the top of their game. Yes, absolutely. Definitely. And we're done for part two. The intermission, if you like. <laughs> <laughs> Come back for part three, though, as we're talking our highlights for the film and rating Pulp Fiction out of 10, which is going to be great, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah.